Mailbag! Today on the BWI Daily Edition, we answer your questions, and I'm going to start every show now by just yelling at you. Mailbag! Dave Eckert filling in for Nate Bauer, who apparently is on vacation. You're allowed to do that, yeah. Dave? I don't think you are. I think we need to have a serious conversation here because, yeah. you know, I'm upset, but it's fine. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm I'm glad you're here uh, because we got a good thing going or we're going to keep that thing going uh, at least for another week with uh, with you and me doing the mailbag questions. So when you see the intro, just know that it's, this is Dave Eckert, not Nate Bauer, in case you get confused. We also have his Twitter handle there underneath him, Dave Eckert 98 Make sure you follow him on Twitter to get all of his insights into Penn State basketball and hockey when he is out live reporting. And uh, before we get to the mailbag, a couple things to go over, Dave. Basketball's coming to the end of the season, so what is uh, the next couple of days look like for them? Where are the games? How can people watch and follow along with you? on social media or at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Yeah, so uh, Penn State closes its regular season at Illinois uh, and at Rutgers. So they're playing Illinois on Thursday. Um, That tips at 7 o'clock. I think it's on FS1. Um, Illinois, I think, is number 20 in the country. They're really good. So kind of a tough ask, but, you know, it'll be an interesting game. Um, And you can follow along. You can subscribe to bluewhiteillustrated.com for just $1. Uh, and you can read all of my super smart and not at all sarcastic uh, posts about the game in our game thread. So I love a good sarcasm, that's... so thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, join us. That's how they do. It. That's how. That's how you say it, right? A sarcasm, like you, you're yes. one per article, Correct. one per tweet, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quota to hit. So, you know, <laughs> Who knew a journalist being sarcastic? What a <laughs> revelation! Uh, The other thing is we are taping this on Thursday. This is the Thursday edition of the BWI Daily, and that is the first day of on-field testing for the Combine. It's been going on now since Monday. Interviews with GMs and players, players getting interviews with GMs and coaches, and, of course, the media getting to meet players like Jahan Dotson yesterday. Uh, Now the, the... the testing begins. My favorite stuff of the running and the jumping and the athletic measurements and things like that. Uh, what do you, if you are looking forward to anything, look forward to at the combine? Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how some of the, like the guys that maybe we consider to be fringe prospects mm-hmm. do. Because the, you know, I mean, this is where you know their their future it it, it is going to be decided. So I, you know, the Tariq Castro Fields, maybe the Jesse Luketa. Um, Rashid Walker, who might have played himself into that category this year. Like, yeah. there are guys who need this. So that's kind of where my focus lies. Um, obviously, you know, it's big for Jahan Dotson, too, because it's going to decide how much he gets paid and whether it's a, a huge a huge mountain of cash or, like, you know, just a lot. A, me- um, <laughs> but, yeah. a medium mountain of cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um you know, I mean, it's important for everybody, but I tend to, I guess, think about the guys who need this um, to get there. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be an interesting week. This it, it's it's it, it's interesting because this is actually a subset of one of my hobbies. I love just mm-hmm. on top of football, just athleticism. Watching these guys do these things. This is like the you know the joke is the underwear Olympics, but it really is like the Olympics because the feats that they're performing are superhuman. To be able to run that fast at that size for guys that are defensive linemen or tight ends or be able to jump 44 inches in the air, I love I love athleticism and I love performance here. And it translates to football, and that's what gets me super excited. That's what supercharges my interest in the combine. But fitness and athleticism and performance are all really cool. And we're going to be getting to our performance here probably towards the end of the mailbag. So you ready for that? Uh, I am. I can't promise it'll be positive, but, (laughs) you know. By the way, if you want to, uh, before we get into the mailbag, make sure you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated, uh, as Dave mentioned, but also here to the YouTube channel. You can get that for just $1 as a combo package because it's free to subscribe to YouTube. It's also (laughs) free to subscribe to your podcast wherever you get those, uh, and we do obviously simulcast these on... uh, 
on on podcast version. For some people, that's the primary thing. I'm looking at a camera right now, so to me, this is all very specifically to YouTube. But anywhere that you want to listen to us, anywhere you want to digest the BWI Daily, subscribe. It's super helpful. And if you like the show, like the video. Helps out a lot. Okay, Dave, let's get to it. Let's get to the mailbag questions today. We had a lot of really good questions this week. I was actually... Uh, very pleased and I want to thank everybody who submitted a question because we got some good ones today. We won't be getting to all of them, but I promise you, if you ask a question, we'll be getting to it on, at the very least, a future episode of the BWI Mailbag Edition. We've got a long off season, so we're getting to all your questions. So just want to say to start out, like if your question is not answered, we absolutely will get to it at some point. If you're a Lion's Den message board member as well, you know, if there's anything we didn't get to, I'll be responding to you on the message board. That is, of course... The advantage of the message board. So let's get to it. Psychim asks, with spring practice on the horizon, yes, spring will come. Some commentary about the weather. What are you most excited about seeing? Any particular positions or players? Does much information leak out of practice? Thanks for your excellent work. Well, thank you for the compliment. Dave, Who uh, we did a, the BWI live show about this a little bit on Monday. Are there any names of that group that you picked out that stand up the most to you that you want to lift from there and answer here? Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously everybody's excited about the highly rated freshmen, right? Um, so, you know, Singleton, Alar, Saunders, you know, that group. Um, kind of maybe straying from that and, and doing something that they're picking a guy that maybe isn't at the top of everybody's mind is I, I've been saying I'm excited about Malik Mega yeah. um, just because I, I think his athleticism is great. And I think he's a guy who given his circumstances, being Canadian, playing Canadian high school football, um, you know, and, and just having to learn all of that kind of make him a guy who, who it makes sense for him to be a late bloomer. Um, Jordan Vandenberg is somebody who Nate has brought up, um, who I think oh, is another oh, Nate, guy. Nate brought it up, huh? Oh, did I, did I misremember? I'm sorry. No, he I did on the show, but I, I planted that oh, okay. seed in his brain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, you know, maybe uh, th that's another guy who we know that Penn State likes, um, who is really interesting. He's from South Africa, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I always I always tend to gravitate towards guys with, with that those those like cool stories. Um, but certainly he's somebody who, who might help help Penn State this year. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. The freshman Jordan Vandenberg, uh, you know. Uh, Malik Mega, a couple other guys, but yeah. yeah. I want I want to say something uh, interesting and introspective here, or or illuminating about anyone that's standing out. There are so many of them this year that I, I I'm having a hard time picking, like Dave just said. But I'll answer the first part of the question with the second part of the question, which is a lot of information doesn't leak out uh, from yeah. especially winter workouts. But what has come out. And uh, if you want to go back and listen to the Tuesday episode of the BWI Daily, which is our recruiting podcast uh, with Greg and Ryan, uh, Ryan said that the, the hype about Zane Durant is real. He is absolutely stealing the show at the defensive tackle position. He's been the mm -hmm. weekly tweet guy three times so far this winter. Uh, we're coming up on max testing day today, by the way. So uh, another quick formatting thing for the show is we're going to be recapping that tomorrow because it's going on at the release time of the daily, which is 4 p.m. Eastern usually uh, each day. So we're going to be there at that point. So we'll recap everything tomorrow on the show on Friday. But Zane Durant is somebody I'm going to be watching at the if we if he's there and he's part of the group that we're watching lift, I'm I'm getting my first up close view of Zane Durant because the hype is starting to build around him as the freshman who's standing out amongst the guys that are early enrollees. Poncho 570 asks, does it mean Vanover, more defensive line talk here, Dave, does it mean Vanover have a permanent home at defensive tackle or will he continue to use, be used at defensive end? Do you think that will hinder his overall development? What do you think yeah, about that, that? That's an interesting one. Um, yeah. Just, just based on what James Franklin has said about him. I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's permanent. Um, he is, I'm trying to find him on the roster here. He's at 283 um right now so yeah i mean he's definitely heavier um 
I don't know, T. Frank, what do you think about this? Because it, it, will, it, will it be too difficult for him to maybe take some weight off and make the move back? What are, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think he played at two, 280 something at defensive end last year. You know, he was at least in the high okay. 270s last year at defensive end. He's never going to be a speed guy. So at that point, I don't know if it really matters. If he's got hybrid ability, let him be hybrid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the the position of defensive tackle now is actually deep. It's deep with unproven guys. So do you want to add another <laughs> unproven guy to defensive tackle? Yeah. Or do you need him at defensive end where you need depth and you need players and competition? So I would kind of lean towards defensive end. I also saw some good things from him at defensive end during the bowl game. So I, not a world beater by any means, but a, a guy that looked like if you gave him some time there and let him be who he is, he could be a power player at defensive end. Long arms, pretty strong, uh, not great burst. That's obviously the problem is can he be 300 pounds and do that as a, as a three technique or do you does he have the, you know, the leanness that isn't going to make him a good run defender? So... I still need more information on Amin Vanover, uh, truthfully. I, yeah. This spring is going to be important for my evaluation of him. Do you, I, I mean, obviously this feels like something that could probably be influenced by whether or not they land some help at defensive end or defensive tackle yeah. um, in the transporter also. So um, just generally, I think having guys that can do multiple things is a good thing, um, right? I mean, it never hurts you. Yeah. So... I think he's a good answer to something that we saw last year with when teams go heavy against Penn State. If you put Amin Vanover at defensive end, there's your defensive tackle. There's putting your goal line package out there. Now, I think Penn State's going to be pretty steadfast and that they're not going to overreact to that. But if they're not thinking that that's going to happen when that's happened to them two of the last three years, that somebody's <laughs> going to go six offensive linemen. And by the way, Minnesota, that's just a part of their offense now. It has nothing to do with Penn State. They go 6-0 linemen all the time. It is it is kind of... I know that I'm going to get blasted for this, but it's kind of sad that like that's their plan. Like, we're Careful, gonna, T. Frank. We are Careful, gonna be, T. Frank. We're going to be less multiple. <laughs> we are going to go backwards in time. And we are going to be less of a threat through the air with six offensive linemen and a fullback and a tight end. And that's how that is their plan of attack at Minnesota. Now, Kirk Chirac is back there. We'll see if that continues. But um, yeah, it's, it's something Penn State has a realistic possibility of seeing. And having that versatility isn't a bad thing. Also, Deny Dennis Sutton's really good against the run. So a lot of those problems can be solved by just having guys that are way better at shedding blocks and getting into the backfield. Uh, so let's move on to uh, John Ashley. John Ashley, this is actually a an interesting one that goes back to that defensive end conversation on Twitter, at Bosfield1. Is it safe to assume, since we haven't heard anything about Adisa Isaac during winter workouts, that he is still sidelined? Dave, we had um, information from James Franklin that that's not the case after the bowl game, correct? Yeah, he was. James Franklin was tweeting about him running, I think is what that tweet said. Okay. Um, or no, he didn't tweet about it. He told Steve Jones, and then somebody else tweeted about it. The internet is confusing. To you. It was on. Um, it was on one of the coaches' shows. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's doing some stuff. Uh, the extent of that stuff, we don't know. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll be able to talk to James Franklin soon once spring practice practice starts here. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think unless he's had a setback, he's been participating in it to some degree um but we'll see exactly where he's at soon here coming up yeah and we'll also have a chance to talk to um uh, chuck losey uh, as of recording yeah. today about who's standing out in the weight room who's making strides we'll get some insight we won't get injury information but part of strength is is rehab and all of those things so we might get more information on this uh, in the coming hours before, you know, as of recording, I, I usually try to make these sound like they're in time, but this one is such a, a mess today that, you know, by the time you're listening to this, the information is probably out. So don't pause this yet because we got great stuff to come, but make sure you're looking for that uh, as soon as you're done here on the BWI Daily. Uh, where do we want to go next? This is a great question actually submitted to me uh, directly on our Facebook message board. Um, and and I it was such a good question that I wanted to bring it up here on the show. So local PSU asks, 
Uh, I'm baffled why Ellis Brooks gets ignored by everyone in the draft process. Are his measurables that bad? He was dominant all in the middle all season long for PSU, and they suffered when he was not in there. Love to hear what you see of him in the upcoming draft. I'll, I'll let you start, even though this is addressed to me because guests get to go first. What are your thoughts on <laughs> Ellis Brooks in the draft and his his overlooked status, not at the Combine especially? Yeah, I don't know. I he, he's to me he seems productive college player with maybe without the athleticism necessary to 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 be a factor at the next level. That's kind of what my read is and 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 continues to be. But but T Frank, you're you're the expert here in in this stuff, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, great at football, and that uh, if he were to be at the combine. I would say that he is one of the three best players at his position from Penn State this year with Dotson, Brisker, uh, Ebikides in that conversation, and Ellis Brooks. He would be probably fourth on that list of guys that are really good at their position. And I might even put him ahead of some of those guys because his skills... One of the things that I saw last year that was different was Penn State was running more cover two, like true cover two, because Ellis Brooks was on the football field and could handle it. And if you've ever seen Tampa 2 is what it's called, because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers ran this in the early 2000s and got to a Super Bowl with it, what it does is it it, it, it takes advantage of an athletic middle linebacker that drops 10 to 15 yards in the middle of the field to protect the middle so that the safeties can take away the deep shots. So essentially, it's 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 a hybrid sort of defense with two high safeties. You've got to have a really smart, athletic linebacker that can handle running downfield. And that is counter to what Ellis Brooks's profile is, but he was able to handle it. His presence in the middle of the field denied a lot of passes that were not thrown, and I think that he had a large hand in that. But when it comes down to it, I was watching him in whichever bowl game he was in whichever um uh, uh senior bowl sort of thing all-star game he was in there was a play that our nate bauer clipped and put up for everybody over on the message board and it was just it was him not getting his hands on a pass because it was too high over his head and i think that is the the concern at the next level for for nfl evaluators is is he long enough is he fast enough is he big enough you know, you have to have some combination of those things to be a starter at the next level. But as I said yesterday on the daily, the NFL doesn't know what it wants in linebackers. They have no idea what yeah. they need. And Ellis Brooks is good at football. So maybe he goes undrafted, but he's absolutely going to make a team next fall because he's too smart. He's too good at his position and he has too many ways to help your team. So I agree with the question. He is being overlooked, but I also understand why. So if he were to go to the combine, he might not run well. He might run a four seven or something like that. I don't have a confirmed time on him. And then you know some of the other measurables. I I he's never seemed like a long football player. And I'm actually trying to look up his length that I can find right now. Um, but those are the things that are holding him back. I think at this point. Yeah, you know it makes sense. Um... Yeah, it's always interesting to me, like the dynamic between okay, he's he's excellent at the college level, but we just have these things where we're not willing to like compromise on when it comes to you know whether or not they'll make good pros. I don't know. Yeah, the, the, the whole like that that whole I guess process is kind of mystifying to me. Yeah. But <clears throat> you know, um, as you said, certainly there are going to be opportunities for him um, even, you know, despite the snub here. So hopefully it works out. Yeah. Sub 31 inch arms is a problem. At least as far as I've, I've found in, in some of my records going back to his recruitment, that it's not a strength of his. And some teams will absolutely just take you off the board. If you don't meet certain physical dimensions, because there's evidence at the NFL level, that if you don't look this way and have these sort of traits, then you won't be successful because we've tried enough times at that level that they uh, that it's just not a thing. So Navy Blue asks, back to Penn State football, given Hunter Norzad doesn't enroll until his Cornell graduation, 
project the two deep for the offensive line this spring, especially if Wormley isn't healthy. Okay, so this is a this is this is a hard thing to do on the fly, honestly, Navy Blue. Uh, it is. Uh, so right. let's 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 do this by position. I think this will be easier to go left to right. So left tackle is Olufashanu. That one's pretty clear. Who would you have yeah. as the guy competing to be his backup at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I feel like we don't really know a lot about the other options, right? Yeah. Um, Jimmy Christ, Bryce Effner. We really haven't heard anything about Ibrahim Traore. Yeah. Um, does Drew Shelton, you know, is he so good that he's in that conversation already? I don't know. I, I would say no. I don't know. He, he needs time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I would not um, count. I would not count on either of the freshman tackles at this point this year. Both have development things they need to get through from either a size or an athleticism perspective where they won't they will they are not going to be factors this year in my opinion. Yeah. I feel like it's Bryce Eppner. Yeah. You know, was just based on what we saw last year. I feel like that's that's the answer here, but um it does feel like there's a group that could kind of compete and you wouldn't really be surprised with with whoever nailed down that number 2 spot. I wouldn't, if I had two of the redshirt sophomores, if I had to pick one for left tackle, it would be Traore as, as a guy that has, I think, more athleticism in air quotes, but there are some pretty big flaws from what I remember of his tape of, okay, so he moves, he he physically in a linear sense can move well, and he's quick for his size and maybe even fast for his size, but there were some balance issues, there was some technical issues there's a lot of stuff he had to work through and now he's had the time to do it but like you said we haven't heard a lot about these guys so I would say it's got to be either uh Bryce Efner who you brought up and I think that's probably the answer and then it's Landon Tengwall as the backup as as a swing guy mm -hmm. who might be starting one place and be the best option at left tackle so right. that would be yeah. there <laughs> so we'll move to left guard of the players, and I'll give you a group here, and he says Caden Wallace, we're going to assume that he's injured at this point. So let's take a look at the guys that are on the list. We have J.B. Nelson, Golden Israel Achumba, uh, uh, Landon Tangwall, and as far as the guys on the list that are scholarship roster guys, I think that's it at the moment. Yeah, so I guess it kind of depends which guard spot you want to put Landon Tangwall in? Yeah. Um, you know, we'll stick him. I'll stick him in left guard. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> right. And start there. But yeah. Um, who's his backup though? I mean, do you, do you feel good enough about JB Nelson? I mean, JB Nelson was the number one overall junior college prospect. Right. So, I mean, do you feel like JB Nelson can, can be a backup for you in his first year here? I mean, maybe. I don't sure. Know. I think that uh, this spring will determine a lot of that next year. So seeing where he is in his technical development, because I feel like he has done a great job of what he can do and what he can control on his own of getting into shape. He did a great job from a bad situation where he was, you know, basically truly quarantined during the pandemic where he couldn't work out, didn't have even the resources that Penn State tried to give their guys um, when they were all sent home. So, he spent the last year and a half reshaping his body, getting back into shape. I think he's done that really well. But then what is his technical development within the parameters of what he's allowed to do during the winter and then in the spring? So he's a backup to me right now, but without the guys that are coming in through the transfer portal yeah, and, and uh, you know, Vega Yuane as a part of this conversation as well, He's pushing in the too deep. He's pushing in the too deep at this point. So I might I, I might see him more as a right guard, but okay. he's a backup here. Maybe a Chumba or um, even Nick Dawkins might be a backup here, who I know has pretty much been locked in as a center so far. So let's flip over there and go to center. Right now it's Juice Scruggs, and right now it's, yep. it's Nick Dawkins. There's really nobody else in this conversation. Um, the, the conversation though, is that Hunter Norzad, it's an open thing that he could try out for center. Do you think there's an advantage of moving Scruggs back to guard? Maybe if he's on the left side between Norzad and Fashanu. I don't know. I thought, yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, if you feel like Norzad can play center, which we don't, I mean, 
did he play that at Cornell, T. Frank? I, or I, I don't know. But he played. I, I liked, he only played tackle. Okay. Oh, that's right. Because we had this conversation about um, he's a guard at Penn State, but Cornell listed him as a tackle. But yeah, yeah I think. I thought Scruggs was okay at center. I don't. I don't necessarily think that I'm in a rush to move him and replace him with someone unproven, um, who is just kind of a guy that you think could play there, but you haven't really seen it. So I would be keeping him there and and kind of figuring things out elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I I don't really know where I fall on that ladder. I guess Penn State has has routinely faced a specific defensive front that is designed to mess with the center. You know, that that puts a nose tackle over top of the center, and it messes up the blocking scheme for zones when it comes to the guard and tackle combos. So having a guy that can just say, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to destroy the nose tackle. Hunter (laughs) Norzad has more of that profile than Juice Scruggs does. So that's why I think it's an open conversation going forward as far as fit and strength. And honestly, that was what, uh, um, oh my gosh, who uh, played there last year. Center, The starting center for Penn State last year, total brain fart. Uh, that's what he was supposed to be able to do. Uh, and then Mike it just, Miranda, Mike Miranda thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> that's what Mike Miranda's profile was between the two. Between the two, the two or three right. options there was he was the more physical player coming from guard. That was the idea that just didn't work out. Uh, so if you want to try that again, I, I think that's the the open conversation there. So then we go to right guard. Who do we have left? <laughs> Who's left? You know, uh, we talk so much about about uh, um, <laughs> potentially putting JB Nelson as a backup. Like I wonder if he has to be a starter <laughs> because. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we're if we're leaving off Wormley, like Navy Blue has kind of stipulated here, because we don't really know, um, and Hunter Norzad isn't a factor, then it's we've already used Tengwall at left guard. Yeah. So then your options are JB Nelson, Golden Israel Chumba, Vega Ione. Um, so I mean, hey, do we what do we what do we know about Golden Israel Chumba? You know, he's been here for a couple of years. We still don't really know that much. Um, he he was Jim a Franklin, he was a big dude in high school yeah. who needed to reshape his body. He was he was three hundred and thirty pounds in high school, and it wasn't a great three thirty. Gotcha. Um, James Franklin, which I thought was interesting, did kind of say, "Hey, we think Vega Ione can can play early." Yeah. Um, so maybe Vega Ione is your backup left guard or your backup guard in general and you put jb nelson starting at right guard under these circumstances i don't know um yeah so you know there again there's three guys that we've got to kind of pick here that we haven't really heard a ton about from the coaching staff so i don't know um i think i would probably go with jb nelson just based on his junior college credentials if i'm being honest um but it's a tough one I mean, if we're taking out two of the main contributors here, then yeah, yeah. If we're if we're going into because that's what this is saying is you go into the depth and that's what you got left. So that's a great yeah. point. And then just to wrap it up, the the two on the right side is Caden Wallace, and then Jimmy Crist would be the primary backup if he if he can push for that. That's this is that's his job this spring is to be the backup right tackle. If not, then again, it's probably Bryce Efner as that swing guy. Mm-hmm. And then if Bryce Effner d- decides that he doesn't want to stay and be the primary swing guy and wants to go play somewhere else, now uh, you ca- I've said you need to clone Landon Tangwall because you can play him <laughs> anywhere. That's where I think you're getting into a problem. Okay, so let's go through some of this. I am a little bit out of order here. Let's do this one. Uh, this is a great... Okay, here, let's have our special teams conversation. Sure. WEP 612, which sounds more like a, uh, a radio dial than it does a Twitter handle, and PSU 87 throwing all the numbers at us. What is your best guess at who will be the kickoff, punt, and field goal personnel this year? And then PSU 87 says, all right, he's, he's like us. He's asking a double question of the coach. Can collegiate <laughs> kickers improve, or are they who they are after four years? Reading in this, will Sanders Sahadak be the kicker this year? Uh, it's a two-question 
question from the two question guy. So Lion09 Lions09 on Twitter getting his double question in. So basically let that's what they want to know. Kicking game, what are you expecting sure. this spring? Just as as a quick tip to Lions09, never ask two questions in one because it gives the person you're asking the choice to just pick one and ignore the other. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh you know, I, I guess I would assume that the field goal kicker is going to be Jake Pinneger. Um, yeah. Right. He's no longer injured. Um, he's a guy that Penn State has trusted in the past. Um, that's just, that seems like it makes sense. Um, the other two, I think, are a bit more up in the air. The, the punter, I would guess, is Alex Pacheta. Um, mm-hmm. if, if I had to guess right now, who um, is, I think, the top punter in the country by Cole's kicking, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, mm-hmm. He's a true freshman. So, I would guess that that's going to be Alex Pachetta. The kickoff thing, I, I have no idea. It's, it's whoever, whoever has the biggest leg. It's, yeah. it's, it's so going to be whoever, whoever has the biggest it. leg, and and that might be Sahedak. I, I don't I don't really know. Haven't seen him kick, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I will say that Barney Amore came back for his sixth season this year, so he thinks he has yeah, a good true. opportunity to be uh, the 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 punter this year. I still want to see Gabe. Nuosu at six six three zero two, be the punter. Uh, also, Think of all the fake punts, D. Frank. Think of all, yeah. Unless he's a fullback back there. He's a fullback. <laughs> you're giving you're giving him like a ten yard head of steam to get your one yard on fourth and one. Even better. Do it. Even better. He's the lead blocker on fake field oh. goals. So, uh, you know, he's the holder, and then he holds the ball, tosses it to the kicker, and lead blocks at 66302. He also is the backup left tackle. We solved it there. He's like, I'm assuming he's got the length to play there. So, you know, we're going to see if he can, he can, instead of doing all the kicking duties, he plays on multiple places on the, on the depth chart. So uh, I think that's a great way for both of these guys of saying, uh, we don't know. <laughs> we, yeah. it, the veteran's going to get the opportunity first because there's more information about them. But Penn State in this area, I think, has shown that they're going to go with who's best. And they have a plan yep. in place of who they want because they went out and got Jordan Stout to come in and, and, uh, and be the punter when they already had a guy on the roster that was pretty dang good that's punting in the NFL right now. So... We'll see. The, the 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 best player here is going to play, and there's an, there's probably a true and very open competition. But yeah, I would just say that Jake Pinnegar probably has the uh, the upper hand there. Let's see, last couple questions here. We're gonna go with this one from Brian. <laughs> Brian asks, oh, man. "What do you and Dave run in the forty? So, Dave, you are very tall. So, do you have a I, a long stride? Uh, that that height, T. Frank, has never in my life translated to anything resembling speed. How tall Even are when you? I won- by the way, I'm six four. I cannot be the backup left tackle. I hate you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's gonna start with a five, T. Frank. <laughs> you That's know, good. maybe That's a good. Six, maybe a six. Um, you know. It's 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 gonna be slow. It's gonna be ugly. You're gonna be like, this guy isn't done yet. Like they they're gonna they're gonna get the hook off the stage. Yeah. Or did hook me behind the curtain because I'm gonna be taking so long running the forty. So it's all about your start. It's gonna be bad. Yeah, I can imagine <laughs> if you can't get down into that sprinter stance, then that that's that's gonna be an issue. Uh. So yeah. so Brian is actually my buddy Brian. And the reason he asks this is because this summer at a bachelor party, we ran 40s. We ran, <laughs> we, we ran a 40-yard dash. Um, it was incredibly scientific. We used the good old one foot in front of the other 40 times to measure. And then like it was the, the end was the garbage can, and you started at the stick. So sure. completely scientific, completely accurate, and uh, I still do not believe my time. I ran a, a five two, I want to say. Wow, five, one. very nice. I f- no, no, because I firmly believe that I can run a sub five forty, especially at the time. <laughs> so, 
So last year, I was going really hard at the gym. I was in the best shape I'd ever been, and I had hit multiple PRs. I uh, like my deadlift was almost six hundred pounds. Like I was, I was explosive. We had gone hiking earlier, and we were running forties. And and to the reason I say that is because I was uh, doing some really dumb stuff while we were hiking in gorges, and I was basically rock climbing. And I was probably a little bit <laughs> sore from that because we did all that, then sat down and drank beer for three hours. Uh, and and we're talking and and, and BSing and then we ran forties. So the long Are you saying that's not what Jahan Dotson is doing today. To probably not. <laughs> and if he did, he would also tear his hamstring like I did. So oh, I was no. I was remembering all of my training in the forty, everything I'd ever heard on the NFL Network about how you're supposed to really reach your foot out and with your toe and pull yourself through and all of those things. And my start was great. I was going to get a sub 540 on the downhill portion of the road in the back in the back roads of whatever area we were in uh, hiking. And I got to about five yards away and I heard the pop and I did that thing where you're like running on one leg for a good Uh, for a good 20 yards afterwards. So luckily and again, luckily, I was smart and married a very smart woman who is a certified strength coach and personal trainer. And she's like, don't ice it. Keep moving it. Don't sit down. So I was able to at least get home before it all locked up. So that was the that was that was the the, the silver lining of all of this. <laughs> but at my best, I believe that I could run a sub five forty. That's the answer. I'm no. buying it. Sure. Why not? Our last question today, and I did want to end on something as ridiculous as that. Oh boy. Uh, ben asks some really interesting question. So. We've been talking about on this show how NIL can basically be whatever you want at this point. It's kind of the Wild West. So Ben asks, at Ben Bainey 84 on Twitter, is there anything preventing Terry Pagula or other billionaires like him from investing in the rest of the Penn State Athletics or the school if it were a different booster and turning the college game into a full minor league farm system for his pro teams? Is the NCAA powerless in this? Because Terry Bagula also owns the Sabres, I want you to answer that portion of it because I don't know the NHL draft and, and the farm system that way. Is that a reality right. for a team like the Sabres? Um, you know, in in for college hockey, the way that college hockey works is different than um, I think pretty much all the other sports. So you are drafted before you enter college. Okay. Sometimes freshmen who have just played their freshman year end up drafted. But by and large, you're drafted before you enter college. You play at college and you either finish college or the your NHL uh, organization decides, hey, you're ready after two years at Michigan or North Dakota or whatever. So it's a little bit different. So, yeah, that's that's an interesting question from Ben because it does kind of seem like you know, <laughs> Terry Pagula, if he wanted to, using, I guess, like NIL funds could just turn like Penn State hockey into like Buffalo Sabres 2. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which right now, Michigan is Buffalo Sabres 2. If you would like to have a conversation a bit with Terry about that one, they've got uh, <laughs> a couple of really talented Sabres prospects. <laughs> but uh, interesting. yeah, that's an interesting one. I don't, I don't necessarily think that applies to football, right? Because yeah. these guys have... Like, they already have a farm system like, for free. Why? Why would exactly. you? Exactly. Yeah. If um. And the players aren't in your organization yet. You know yeah. what I mean. So like by the time they're in college, so you don't know which players are which. Yeah. Um, the the draft the the NFL draft eliminates that reality because yeah. Once they go into that pot, they're you know whoever has the pick gets them. Uh, if if Jerry Jones can't turn Arkansas into a powerhouse, then this isn't. This isn't a thing because he's been trying for years as yeah. one of the uh, most famous and uh, most long tenured owners in the NFL that uh, is a huge Arkansas Razorbacks fan. And they've been real bad until this last year where they were pretty good. So I think that that when it comes to NIL, it has to be more about your team that you want to root for and less about uh, turning it into a minor league, minor league farm system for your team because right. the why would you pay for something that is already free? 
The NFL doesn't pay college football anything to exist. College football exists, and then they take the best players and filter them into the NFL. So there would be no incentive for you to create your own farm system because you might just be helping your competition. So if you get uh, three five-star guys to go to Penn State and they win a national championship and they all go in the top 10 and you pick 30th, you know, because the Bills are going to be in the Super Bowl or in the championship game from now until I die. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's, 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 the, uh, that's the truth and the reality of the situation. Then it doesn't do you any good. So I think it's a great question as far as how money affects NIL, but with focusing on the major league owners, yeah. Terry, Terry Pagula has not, the, he does not, I don't think, interfere a lot with the, the workings of the organization. Uh, I think he's a fan, but when it comes down to it, Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, the GM and the head coach, have full autonomy to pick whoever they want, and they've picked a lot of Pitt players. <laughs> they picked a lot of guys from Pitt, not a lot of guys from Penn State. <laughs> Such a tell. Yeah, yeah, it is an interesting question, though. I think there, it has kind of Ben. Ben might be onto something when it comes to hockey. To be honest with you, uh, yeah, I, I think the way things are structured, but everything else, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I we'll see we will see if there are I think not tectonic seismic those are all words we use all the time but earth-shattering reality bending changes to college sports. So the idea of like a FIFA level stratification or or a European soccer level of stratification of there are there's a super league of the Ohio states and Alabama's and Oregon's and Ohio you know there's though that premier league that then becomes a true minor league system and just completely breaks away and then you have your other schools that try to get into that that group or if there's something like that then you would have the conversation of well then I can funnel money into my school that is then uh, going to you know make that go into that top program, but even then, as long as the NFL draft exists, there is no incentive for you to pour money into right. a minor league system that isn't yours. It's just where are you getting the right. players and how do you find the best ones? So yeah, they could the NFL if they wanted to have a minor league system could just follow uh, MLB's lead and pay them you know not a living wage and. Uh, yeah, they but. get away with doing that now, <laughs> and they they like they have their hands are not on it right now, and that's the whole that is the whole change right now in in college sports is that it is a minor league system for pro sports, and there is a there is a change in how people are viewing the players on the field and how they're being treated and what we think is fair compensation outside of a degree and the cost of living at at a place like State College, and and that's. That is, uh, you know, I'm not picking sides on that. That is the fact of what we're going through. Is there anything you want to ask here on the mailbag, Dave? Do you, do you have any questions, anything you want to bring up as we end the show? T. Frank, I want to know how you're doing today. How is T. Frank's life? That's what I want to know. Uh, so I'm one of those people that will answer that if you ask me the question. So do you, Please. you Okay. Please. Uh, yeah. So I, I've had this really annoying thing over the last two weeks. It's called thoracic outlet syndrome, where oh, basically no. you have nerve pain down your arm. Yeah. Uh, going back to our conversation about running the 40, after the entire football season of, of taking time off from the gym, I went back and my body was like, dude, what are you doing? And so my whole <laughs> arm was just gave up after doing uh, an exercise. And then I was like, you know what will help this? I'm going to now squat. So I put, you know, 275 pounds on my back and squatted and then my arm just short circuited. So yesterday was the first time that I've slept throughout the night in wow. about three weeks. So I'm feeling great today. Like I'm having a good time on the show. It doesn't hurt to sit here and I don't want to, I don't want to be done. So that's why we're dragging out the end here is I'm having a good time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, you know, you've got you've got the pep in your step today. It's noticeable. I'm well, glad. I'm excited because later today we're going to go and we're going to get a real taste of actual lifting and actual athletes and not my garbage I'm talking to you about here on the show. So stay tuned for that from Blue White Illustrated, from bluewhiteillustrated.com. You're going to get photos of the event. You're going to get breakdowns of the event. You're going to get uh, the recap on Friday here on the Daily Edition. And, of course, if you want to follow us on Twitter to get our reactions there as well. But the best place to get it, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just a dollar, and you get all this information for 12 
months. So next season, when we're going into this and it's like, okay, now Drew Aller and Bo Perbula and Christian Veyu are battling it out to see who's going to be the starter. And we're going and seeing them max pe- max test and we're seeing all this stuff. You're going to still get all that information for a dollar a year from now. So sign up now, get all that information, get in the know with Blue White Illustrated. And of course, if you like me and you like the show, like this video and subscribe to Blue White Illustrated. It keeps uh, it keeps us dancing with the hat on the, on the corner for our money. So Dave, thanks for coming on the show. You got it, D-Frank, anytime. Once again, wrap up of the week coming up on Friday. Don't know TBD who's going to be joining me, but we're going to be talking about Penn State's max, te- max testing day and who stood out. And of course, our first introduction to Chuck Losey as the new strength coach for Penn State football. All that tomorrow on the BWI Daily. Talk to you then.